The program is Bull's Eye on Splash 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station. I am Edmondo Billo. Good morning and welcome. My guest on Bull's Eye this morning is Dr. Kunle Olajide, a former secretary of the Yoruba Council of Elders. Dr. Lajide, it's good to have you on Bull's Eye. It is a pleasure to have this privilege of talking to Nigerians. Are you impressed that in your lifetime, your country is still grappling with the basic issues of development? I cannot be impressed. This is the twilight of my life. Once you are above 70, you have received your boarding pass, waiting for your flight to be announced. And it is a pity that at my age i cannot enjoy 18 hours power supply every day it's a pity that there is insecurity everywhere there are a lot of things that make you very unhappy look at the state of infrastructure can you remember the 1966 attempt by the student of the university of ibado to perhaps embarrass the nigerian state stop it from hosting the commonwealth prime minister's meeting in this country well, thank you very much. You have really rubbed on my very raw nerves because I was one of those students who participated in that protest march to Lagos. West was burning. We had what we call Operaton Wete. And why was it burning? It was because of federal government's intervention, ugly intervention, attempting to slow down or halt or disrupt the progress of Western region at that time. And because of that, elections were mercilessly rigged. And they were trying to foist on the Western region a government that was not popular at all. And people reacted spontaneously with what we called Operation Wet. Then houses went up in flames. Human beings were roasted, electoral officers and so on who were manipulating figures were burnt, vehicles were burnt and so on. The West was virtually burning. And then we heard that there was going to be a Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference in Lagos. We could not stomach it at all. So we arranged to move to Lagos from Ibadan, which we did. I think we set out at about 6.30 a.m. in the morning. We hadn't had breakfast. Old road, tortuous road, through Shagamu, Ikurudu, and so on. As we were approaching, I think we were Ikurudu between Shagamu and Ikurudu, our advance team we are coming to brief us that the federal government was fully prepared to meet us force for force and they had amassed policemen in battle gear ready at the junction of maryland in fact that infuriated us the more and you know you students i'm sure you were a student before we felt yes we were going to meet them force for force so what happened we continued the journey we, we continued the journey to lagos when we were about, um, I would say, about 500 meters from Lagos, we saw rows of policemen. The roads were blocked by policemen, lined up. They stopped our vehicles and they ordered us out of the vehicles, which we did. They insisted we must sit down on the floor and that they wanted to talk to the leaders of the students. Of course, I moved to the front line. I, I was very quite familiar with demonstrations and I know that when policemen throw their tear gas canisters, they throw it over and above their head. So if you move near them, you escape the fumes. So I was at the front row and I had the negotiation between the police officers and the student union leadership. They said we should turn back. Our leaders insisted we were not going back. They said they would not allow us and they gave us about 10 minutes to change our minds and get back into our buses and ride back to Ibadan. We refused. So when the 10 minutes elapsed, they ordered the policemen to shoot tear gas canisters. Of course, we started running. The policemen were chasing us. By the time we were about two kilometers from that spot, they had succeeded in arresting some of our students who inhaled the fumes of the tear gas. But of course, some of us were still strong. One thing I can take away from this is the resistance offered by the students to the state. If we had such resistance at constant basics, do you we, think this country would be at this point? Thank you very much. We would not be where we are today. 
the resistance is, is, is lacking now. Uh, students, union, uh, youths have been compromised. But even when they dare, the university authorities clamp down very hard on them. I will tell you our story. Perhaps uh, in my class, I was one of the youngest two then. I was very young. We had matured men in those days. People who had families coming to the universities and so on. Not what obtains now, that most of them are just teenagers. The university authorities respected us. We played responsible student unionism. And no government authorities or political parties infiltrated the university. We, they had, we had students, the wings of political parties then. It was allowed in the university. Uh, by 1966, I was the assistant secretary of the Action Group Students' Union. And um, so we played responsible unionism. And the university authorities respected us for it. Professor Dickey was our vice chancellor. If I continue with my story, by the time we had, with the police chasing us and we moving backwards, traveled about a kilometer on and half, the police exhausted their tear gas canisters. They were tired too because they are human beings. Of course, we were tired. So they now made, they were making overtures to us. And we told them, we will not go back unless they released all the students they had arrested. They agreed to release them. By this time, it was going to about 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. Some the struggle that started around 12 noon. And they, when they released our students to us, then we turned back. The interesting thing is this. We didn't know at all that they had arranged to arrest us at um, Idea Yure Roundabout when we got approached about it. We were already tired, exhausted, no meals, nothing. We saw just one policeman standing on the highway, not knowing that at the other end they had multiples of jeeps and the, the, the policemen in anti-riot gear waiting for us. So they stopped our bus. We stopped. The policeman peeped into. My bus was in the front and said, you are students from Union. We said, oh, yes, we are going to back to our campus. They said, uh, we are, they are sorry. Then he blew a whistle. And we saw policemen coming out of the bush in numbers. Of course, we laughed at them. Because we said there was nothing they could do to us. But what did they do? It's interesting to know what they did. The entire ring road now, there was no single house there. The road had just been constructed. So they led us, some policemen in front of, the, of our convoy, some at the back. They drove us through ring road straight to Yagonku police station. So they arrested us and kept us. We were many on the grass. They are seated. That was at about 5.30 to 6 in the evening. Surrounded us with policemen. The news filtered to our vice chancellor. Fortunately for us, university council was meeting. Our VC, our registrar, the principal officers came to Yagoku police station to bail us because they said we were under arrest and detention. And the bail process was very interesting. You will be amazed at the support we had from the authorities. The police insisted they wanted the VC to sign every student's name. In other words, you will mention your name, the faculty you are in in the University of Ibadan, and the VC will append the sixth nature as the surety for your bail. What did we do? Each of us gave wrong names and faculties that were not in existence in the University of Ibadan, and the VC would nod, I know him, and sign. I can't remember the name I gave, and I said faculty. Why did he, why did he do that? He wanted the students out of that. We were about 250. Could and I he say that he, he did that in solidarity? I wouldn't know what... Well, I think it should be in solidarity. Because or he knew those the, faculties did not exist. They did not exist. But he wanted us out of the police net under any condition. I must remind you, we had had an ugly experience in the at that time. What happened? We were coming to demonstrate. It was around that period too. And the police invaded our campus. That was the first time the police was invading our campus. They brought policemen from the north, northern region, not our own regular policemen here. They invaded our hostels. So the university authorities were already familiar with the brutality of those strange policemen that were 
sent to the western region to come and oppress westerners who were protesting against the federal authorities dr laji the, the state has always been hostile right yes you talked about the tortuous road to lagos to make a point you talked about the insensitivity of the nigerian state this was in the 1960s has anything changed well we've made some progress we have made some progress but my experience in the last couple of months is not encouraging at all now people know their rights this is 21st century nigeria we were talking of 28th century nigeria at that time people there is uh, more enlightenment now in the society um yes police again because if judging from the amnesty report of what happened in the northeast in the last uh, 24 months you will see that um, our security agencies are not keeping to the professional rules of engagement is that not the fault of the nigerian state it is the fault of the nigerian state look at what happened in i think it was kaduna with this El Zaki thing where so where, where, where thousands were killed and were buried if a country consistently deal with its citizens in such a way what is always the consequence the consequence is straightforward no patriotism people talk glibly about patriotism when you are talking about patriotism you must have seen your nation caring for you it is in a nation that cares that engenders and inspires patriotism in its citizens what the usual consequence of that is that at a stage the people will rebel you cannot fool the people all of the time you are quite familiar with the french revolution in fact it is the revolution of the proletariat that is most dangerous you cannot predict the end and i think nigeria unfortunately we are inching towards a stage where people are bound to rebel Dr. Kunle Olajide on Bull's Eye. He is a former secretary of the Yoruba Council of Elders. Don't go away, we will be back. Welcome back. My guest is Dr. Kunle Olajide, a former secretary of the Yoruba Council of Elders. Dr. Olajide was the secretary general of the Yoruba Agenda Committee on the National Conference. During the return of the Fourth Republic, Afenifere was a strong group that championed the cause of the Yoruba people. Before we knew it, the group came crashing, and you, among others, decided to champion a new movement known as the Yoruba Council of Elders. Why did that happen? Thank you very much. You are very right that Afeniferi was one of the leading force in Nadeko that brought back democracy to this country. That's true. And immediately after 1999, Afeniferi was the in thing among the Yoruba people. And you remember, if you recall, the five Yoruba states were won by Alliance for Democracy that you could rightly describe as the political wing of Afeniferi. Now, Chief Obasanjo became president of Nigeria. And some of our elders, I'll mention names here. Uh, late Chief Mrs. H.I.D. Awulowo, Papa Reverend Alayonde, and Joseph Sadewale Thompson, including Chief Bolaige, felt that Yorubas needed to give some support to Chief Obasanjo because Awulowo fought tooth and nail to become the leader of this country, but some forces stopped him even when he won. In quotes, election. Now, Chief Obasanjo is president of Nigeria, even though the Yorubas did not vote for him at all. And they thought, in our wisdom, he's a Yoruba man, and at that time he was representing Yoruba. People will cite it in history that the Yoruba world was president. So they thought it was necessary for us to give him the support to make him succeed. And that was, but Afeniferi was still. Firing shots at him. 
because he was not the candidate of Alliance for Democracy. He you was, were a member of Afeniferi. All of us time. were members. In fact, Mrs. Aulo and so we are the people who founded what Afeniferi was. Can it be said here that Obasanjo used the likes of Bolaigi, Palayode, and even Dr. Olajide to disunite Yoruba land? That cannot be correct at all. Because, in fact, Obasanjo was not even in the know. You will be amazed that young men like you, they are still young. I think one of them was here some time ago, Victor Taiwo, uh, Dixon Ogushua. They were the full soldiers of the YCA. We had founded the YCA. If you knew the personalities I'm talking about, nobody could use them. Chief Obasanjo, when he was military head of state, almost single-handedly stopped Tawu Lowo from being president of this country. So you will know that he could not have been in the good books of the Awolowo family. Yes, because yeah. Bolaigi fell out with the core of Afeniferi, he decided to walk against them, right? He did not walk against them. Uh, it's a shame. If I knew this question would come up, I would bring a memo that I took. I was a member of the Alliance of Democracy. In fact, I contested for the governorship ticket of a Kitty state on the platform of Alliance of Democracy. I lost to the governor there in Adibayo. Then that governor, even before he assumed office, came, visited me in my house the second day after the primaries and insisted I had to be the chairman of his own campaign committee, which I was, and insisted I had to go to the Senate. And um, at the D. Rovans, you must have heard about D. Rovans' uh, meeting. That was where uh, Chief Alai was picked instead of, in quote, Chief Bolaige. And I lost too because they picked um, Senator Oni of blessed memory, who was the son of Chief T. A. Oni, on the basis that the wise men in the Romans said that um, Chief T. A. Oni financed Action Group and as such, and I was a relatively unknown young man, and so on. It was not Bolaige. When we formed this, the first attempt was made to dissuade Afeni Ferry from firing shots. We did not just break out. Papa Lionde, late Chief Mrs. Aulowo, late Justice Thompson is unfortunate, they are all dead. They attempted to change the thinking, the cycle of Afeni Ferry, that now our son is there. Let Afeni Ferry back him because, in the event if he failed as president, other Nigerian nationals will say Yoruba failed. Who truly initiated the formation of the Yoruba Council of Elders? Justice Adewale Thompson. Adewale Thompson was the Attorney General under Bolaige. Bola yes, you are right. Was he not working for Bolaige to form the YCE? He was not working for Bolaige. Some of us, I as a person, was against Bolaige's taking appointment in Obasanjo's government. Did you tell him? I told him. I have a memo. I will let you have a copy of the memo. Alliance for Democracy in the National Assembly constituted the committee to investigate the crisis we are talking about in Alliance for Democracy. And they invited people to come. I went all the way from Ibadan. I still have the copy of my memo today. I devoted a whole paragraph to Chibolaige's appointment. It was a subheading in my memo. At that sitting, Ambassador Fafura was present. A lot of people were present. I think Chibisi Akode himself was present. Some few people were present. It was in Nikon Noga Hilton then. Under Bolaige, I can tell you almost verbatim what I wrote. I said it was unfortunate for Chief Bolaige, a leader of the progressives, to take appointment in a conservative government run by the People's Democratic Party. That who told him that in year 2003, Bolaige or Izefi would not be the person in Aso Villa. And I likened it to a situation where an army general with handcuff in hands walks into the enemy territory. I went for that to say that if at the cabinet meeting they were discussing policies of their party, what would he have to contribute as he was not a member of their political party? I said it was dangerous and I sincerely concluded in my last sentence that I hope Chief Bolaige will come out of that office on hot. It was prophetic. I he was, did not he, come out on he, he did not. It was prophetic. I was given a standing ovation. I have copies of the memo. What and was I his dropped, reaction to your memo? Thank God you asked that question. Brilliant question. As soon as I left 
the city. I drove straight to his house. He was not at home. I dropped a copy of the memo for him. I came back to Ikiti, dropped one for my governor. And of course, journalists took from me. Two or three weeks after that sitting, Professor Tudi Adenino, I think he lost his mother. So there was the funeral ceremony in Ikiti, in Igede Ikiti. As soon as we came out of church, Ibolaige saw me. And he waved and called me, Kule Kule, did I not discuss with you before I took the appointment? I said, you did not discuss with me, sir. He said, I thought I did. You were on my list. I discussed with a few radical young men like you. I wanted your opinion. I said, if you had discussed with me, you would not take the appointment. He said, I read your memo. And let me confess to you that I'm getting out of the government very soon. That was what he told me. And he did not get out of the government? He did not get out of the government, unfortunately. It is so complicated. There are times you want to ask, who killed Bolaige? But nobody seems to know the answer. I don't know. Uh, it's difficult to try to provide an answer because the investigation was aborted. And um, when you have investigations of such dastardly murder, of the chief law officer of your country aborted, then you know there must be some powerful forces in court behind it. Do you feel today that the YCE really defended a true son of Yoruba land? I think so. I believe so. Has Oba Sanjo ever been a Yoruba son, a son of Yoruba land in the true sense of the word? It depends on what you mean. The true sense, uh, in the sense that his parents is, a, is an offspring. In my own normal In terms of charting the course of Yoruba nation. If even in your family, you have just three or four children, you may have one who sometimes thinks differently from the way you think. That does not make him a rebel. It doesn't make him an outcast. So to me, Obasanjo, true son of Yoruba land, he did not, but he was more of a Nigerian. Uh -huh. So for us, a Yoruba man was there. We must support him. We supported him. Fortunately, at the 24th, 11th hour or 23rd hour, the Afeni Ferry that refused to support him with us when we appealed to them now threw in their heart into Obasanjo's camp. They gave him support for the 2003 elections. And it was disastrous. AD died because of that. That is not the reason AD died. The governors did, lost the election. Uh, yes, they did. That they didn't mean AD should die. Tinumbu still won. He was the only man standing. If he still... If Tinumbu still remained in the AD, AD would not have died. Afeniferi would still have remained strong, appealing to the sentiments of the people, commending the governors of even PDP when they did well, and criticized them when they did not do well. But it was the, because of Tinumbu backing out of... Tinumbu didn't want to be controlled by old men. My dear brother, was he wrong? He was wrong. He was wrong. He was wrong. They campaigned for all the candidates. These same old men went around all the, the, the states, the southwest states, to campaign. And it was the goodwill and credibility of these old men that gave Tinumbu the ticket. You know, Tinumbu was not in the country. He was in um, the, the exile during the period leading to the 1998 elections. He but, he came back. but he proved them wrong, that he uh, can do it. And he, he did it. Today, he's the super politician in the Southwest. It depends on what you mean, my brother. It depends on what you mean. If you are reading the barometer very correctly, which I imagine you should do, get, judging by your level of intellectual depth, I'm not too sure Tinumbu is very happy now. Because for 23 years, Tinumbu is my friend, childhood friend. We grew up together in Ibadan. Childhood friend. Even when he became governor. Before he was sworn in, he came here to take me to Lagos. So we are friends. Tinumbu has been championing the cause of restructuring of Nigeria for over 20 years. Now, APC is in government. A government he labored tirelessly to install. And I have said it, I commend the courage of Tinumbu. You may not like his politics. But he successfully built a platform that removed an incumbent president. But what is happening now? Are you I, sure he's not happy, Dr. Lajide? He's your friend. Are you sure your friend I, is not happy? Perhaps I have to qualify it. He's happy, his sympathy is in government. But whether he's happy with the goings on is what I'm not too sure. I haven't seen him for quite a while. But I know 
that some of the things i mean you remember a few months ago when he made an open declaration against uh, ibe kachuku that is not the sign of somebody who is happy with the goings on because being his government he could have invited kachuku or picked the phone and talked to mr president but if you send such a, a stinging article letter to the public space then you it, know it's a sign of discontent with the goings on there do you today feel that there was no need for the YCE because the YCE seems to be a dead organization. You will be amazed. It's, it's not dead. It's, so much went wrong with YCE. Of course, as you know, with any organization, opportunities will come in that will dilute or completely invert, reverse what you stood for. Opportunities came in. People who were not part of the movement, who did not know what we stood for, and um, so it is not dead. It is still active. But we are trying to revive it now. It was formed to help Obasanjo. Obasanjo is no longer there. So we should assume that the objectives of YCE has been accomplished. So it, it should go right. That is a wrong assumption. Obasanjo was a symbol of Yoruba nation at that time. So the body was formed to support anything Yoruba and he was the highest office holder and it was necessary for us to prove to Nigerians that we have the expertise to give a good government. So objectives of Yoruba of Yoruba Council of Elders is to promote everything Yoruba, cultural, business, industrial, educational, the language, the history of Yoruba nation. Why not collapse that body into a Fenifere and move on? Afedifere himself has gone into splinters. I'm sure you are aware of Afedifere Renewal Group and there's another United Renewal Afedifere and so on. But we are working very hard now to bring all these bodies together. If you recall, a few months ago, I was the chairman of the planning committee of Yoruba Summit where we succeeded in bringing Yoruba, the leadership of Yoruba organizations together. YCE was there represented by General Adebayo. Afenifere was there represented by the Secretary General Laru Bofa. Udua People's Congress, the two factions were represented by Dr. Fasheum, Chief Ghani Adams, and so on. So we are trying to forge a common front now. And um, I sincerely hope we will succeed. But where you have ego problems, you know, Yorubas will say, that I fagba in other words, where you do not differ to an authority, then the, the, the body will not hold. Uh, so Dr. we are Lagi, working hard, yes. Do we need a Yoruba leader now? I think a Yoruba, the issue of Yoruba leadership, to my mind, is obsolete. Have you had the British leader, or leader of the Germans, or leader of the Canadians, and so on? No. What we need... We need leadership group. It has to be, you are a leader in your field. I respect you. I doff my heart to you. You can be part of the leadership of wherever you come from. But the era of having somebody imagine as Yoruba leader or Igbo leader is gone and gone forever. The situations created it at that time when we had our lower chosen as Yoruba leader. Those situations don't exist anymore. But what we are trying to do is to mass opinion. You have you mass opinion, the artisans, the, the, the broadcasters, media people like you, professionals, accountants, doctors, and so on, industrialists like the IG here, bring them together to synergize and synthesize where, what they think will be in the best interest of Yoruba nation. Because we are in a fiercely competitive, heterogeneous polity in Nigeria. We must not deceive ourselves. One ethnic group is trying to lord it over the other and so on because we have not been given a one sense of Nigerianness. We will that talk about problem. that after this break. I'm discussing with Dr. Kunle Olajide, our former secretary of the Yoruba Council of Elders. Welcome back. The program is Bull's Eye, and Dr. Kunle Olajide is my guest. You were a member of the 2014 uh, National Conference in Abuja. Yeah. And some recommendations were made. Before you went to that conference, 
you were the general secretary of the Yoruba Agenda Committee on the conference. That's Yoruba aspect of the conference talked about restructuring of the Nigerian Federation. You still stand by that? Let me first of all correct you. We did not call it Yoruba agenda. We call it Yoruba position. It's a Nigerian agenda. So it's not an agenda for Yoruba people. No, 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 no. So we corrected that. We stand solidly by restructuring. This country will not move forward if we don't restructure this country politically, structurally, economically, in all aspects. Who is stopping the restructuring of Nigeria? We believe those who are the greatest beneficiaries of the status quo. Who are these ones? The northern part of this country. If you permit me to say, Aousa Fulani, I don't know how familiar you are with the history of West Africa. They are noted for relentlessly pursuing political power to dominate others. I don't know how much you know of the caliphate or the 1904 war in the northern part of the country. Aousa Fulani is just about a minority in the north. They are a minority. Uh, but they took over from the Aushas, and of course we now call them Aousa Fulanis. They have been the greatest be- beneficiaries of this centralized system. And some of us feel that um, those who are benefiting from this status quo are the ones hindering. Because I had, and I watched Mr. President on television a few days ago, saying the resolutions of that conference should be kept in the archives, that he has kept them in the archives. I thought that was grossly insensitive. And I begin to wonder whether we have good advisors for Mr. President. If you say the Aousa Fulani is the group working against the restructuring of the Nigerian state, now that you have a Buhari, a core Fulani man, do you still expect a restructured Nigerian state? Yes, I do. I do. And that's why I said whoever advised Mr. President to say what he said at that time wrongly advised him. I mean, there is crisis everywhere in Nigeria now. Let me make this point clear. There is no section of this country that is happy with Nigeria as it is today. Notice you have the Boko Haram insurgency there, spearheaded by the Kanuris. Let, don't let's deceive ourselves. North Central is boiling because of the Fulani headsmen rampaging the entire North Central belt. Northwest, there is no peace there. That was where you had the, the, the El Zazaki. Uh, what's his name of his movement now? I don't. I can't remember. Islamic, the, movement, Islamic movement of Nigeria. Of, there is no peace. South, south, you and I know, is boiling. Southeast is boiling. Southwest is acquiescing. That's the word I will use. I chose it carefully. We are we are not happy because we believe that we have been slowed down by the Nigerian state. And we believe that certain institutions were built to slow us down. Quota system was introduced to slow the Yorubas down. Joint Admission Matriculation Board was introduced and then you see to control admissions into university to slow us down. When you have different cutoff points for different universities in different parts of Nigeria, you have some states that have been classified as educationally disadvantaged in the last 40 years, and they still remain so. Getting priority, preferential allocations of admission. So we believe that the Nigerian states as it is has slowed us down and slowed the entire country down. Because each of the units, including the Alpha Fulani areas, have not maximized their potentials. What this, system, you- this, this system compels indolence. Mental indolence, physical indolence. Because you go to Abuja with begging bulls to collect money every month from federal allocation. And perhaps if you allow me to say, where does this federal government money come from? It comes from the states. And the same states that own it now go with begging bulls to take pitiance every month. Instead of allowing the states to control, explore and exploit their resources, for the benefits of their people and pay taxes to the federal government. You were one of the elders at the 2014 conference. Yes. What did you observe during the discussion on the restructuring of Nigeria 
from the different ethnic groups that were present. We started the conference. Two weeks into the conference, we hit a big wall because they insisted, the, the, the opening speech of Mr. President said, uh, I think 70% must agree on every point before we make it a resolution. And we taught them it was, perhaps it could not be easy to get that. Some people insisted. Those who did not want restructuring insisted that you will know the Northern Caucus there. Amadou Kumasi, I think he led, he led the dominant delegation, the chairman of Arewa Consultative Forum and so on. They, they were insisting. So what did the management do? The management at that time constituted in their own opinion a committee of 50 wise men and women. I was one of those 50 people. Then we sat for two, three days. Then we agreed that it will be consensus, all right. But don't put figures because we thought it would not be in the best interest of this country to start voting and so on. So we agreed and uh, we succeeded. And all the over about 503 resolutions were adopted by consensus. There was no minority report. Everybody signed, including Kumasi. Did they truly sign for the restructuring of the country? They signed. They signed the resolutions. But as soon as Buhari won the election, if you recall, I think it by the time it was sworn in, it was sworn in in May 29th, by June, the same people who signed the report organized a northern conference in the north. Uh, spearheaded by Junaid Mohammed. Junaid Mohammed was a member of the conference, organizing another conference. And uh, it was um, the vice president who went and declared it open on behalf of the president, trying to sabotage what we did. And I imagine that was why Mr. President said the 2014 resolution had been kept in the archive. So can you say from all these complications that the likelihood of restructuring the Nigerian state through a peaceful means is not there. Those who make peaceful resolution of conflicts impossible make violent resolutions inevitable. You can see what is happening now. I don't like violence in any form. I'm a liberal. I'm not an activist. But if you make it impossible, I sincerely hope these Avengers will not bring Nigeria down to its knees. They are calling for a sovereign Niger Delta. Does that scare you? Let me tell you, when you want to bargain, you ask for the uppermost, the utmost. But where you are going really is restructuring resource control. Yes, you see, we cannot escape restructuring. And I think this is the time to do it. When there is restiveness, right, left, and center. Don't you think the state can forcefully calm this restiveness in the southeast and in the south-south? Well, I don't know. Well, from your name, I think you are a Christian. My religion tells me there is one part of man that does not die. That is the human spirit. It's difficult to kill the human spirit as long as there is injustice. The body language of Mr. President must convince all Nigerians that this government is going to be all inclusive up till now i have not seen that he did not mention the fulani headsman during his may 29th day broadcast i think that was grossly insensitive to the nigerian people these headsmen had murdered over a thousand people in the last nine months and they are still on rampage and yet mr president did not utter a word i think that was to my mind, some disservice to the people who elected. You are from Ekiti State. I am from Ekiti State. And your governor has told his people, if they come near you, kill them. I'm on all fours with my governor as far as saying that nomadic grazing should be banned. But I'm not on all fours with him in saying that people should commit murder and take loss into other hand. I probably would have want to said it in a different way. I would have said, arrest them. You are a medical doctor. You run a hospital. Are you impressed with the health sector? Absolutely not. I'm not impressed with the health sector. Neither am I impressed with any sector of Nigerian life. Nigerians are dying every day. Precisely. No drugs in the hospitals. The states cannot even run the few hospitals they have. And people have no money to patronize even private hospitals. In a state where salaries have not been paid for five, six months. So how do you cope with your hospital? 
well, we are coping. It's difficult, but we thank God for HM Health Management Organizations and the National Health Insurance Scheme that is covering just a tiny percentage of the Nigerian population, but it's affecting us very badly. Very, very badly. I am very sad in the twilight of my life with the state of the nation. May God help us. Dr. Kunle Olajide, thank you for featuring on Bull's Eye. It is a pleasure having this opportunity. I've been discussing with Dr. Kunle Olajide, a medical doctor and a former secretary of the Yoruba Council of Elders. You have any comments? My email address is eobilo at splashfm1055.com. eobilo at splashfm1055.com. You can send a text message. The number is 080-399-18449. 080-399-18449. You can also leave a message for me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at eobilo. At eobilo. Next Monday is another time on Bull's Eye. Until then, I am Edmond Obilo. Thank you for listening. <laughs>